Hello, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and this is the first part of my lecture on Othello and the idea of race in Shakespeare. The very simple question that I wish to begin with is, what does Othello's blackness, or supposed blackness, actually mean? The problem that we face when trying to answer this question is that the categories of identity that we use, such as race, were very different in Shakespeare's time than they are now. Different aspects of one's life formed and determined one's identity, and they didn't really have a notion of race in the same way that we think about race. In the modern world, race is considered a biological category, although there are various problems with considering race as a scientific reality. But it's considered to be biological, and it signals that there's some sort of common heritage among people who are viewed to be of a particular race. And race is, is a difference that's rooted in skin color and physical features. However, as I've talked about on another one of my lectures, race always intersects with issues of nationality and religion and culture. However, in Shakespeare's culture, they did not hold the belief that the physical, biological fact of skin color signaled some essential category or quality about a person or group of people. Instead, other aspects of one's life would have been considered much more important for defining who that person is. For example, their family, their nation or language, their religion, their sex and gender, or the class and social status. All of these were far more important to identity, and as we'll see, the word race was used in Shakespeare's time for each one of these categories in different ways. We can note that the word race is only used 16 times throughout Shakespeare's plays. And at least a couple of th those times, it's used as in running a race, as in the physical contest. But it's even when it's not used in that way, it's never used in the modern sense, or at least not quite exactly in the modern sense, although sometimes it is used in similar ways. Uh, and interestingly enough, the word race is not used in the play Othello. One way in which race was used in Shakespeare's time was to talk about one's lineage. So a race could be a family group, and by this we mean the extended family, not just the immediate nuclear family, but the whole line. Uh, or the pedigree or bloodline. One's bloodline was one's race. And so we can see here some of the roots of the modern biological definition of race. And in this usage, it could refer to humans, uh, animals, even plants. It could, be, it's a, it could be used to refer to a kind of species or breed. Uh, so, for example, a particular breed of dogs could be called a race. Uh, and this could also refer to the entire group. So dogs, all dogs are a race, or all humans are the human race. And this is, shows us just how important heredity and family was to identity, that one of the first and primary ways that one identified oneself was by your relatives, by the line that you come from. And this also shows how important sexuality is to the concept of race, and still is today. Uh, breeding is the basis of race in this usage. Race is a sexually based, sexually reproduced, we might say sexually transmitted quality. Race could also refer to one's nation, one's national identity. And this is important because national boundaries were becoming more fixed during this period. There is a process of centralization in many countries in Europe and nation building, the origin of the modern nation state. So as borders and boundaries became more fixed, the nation as a category of identity became more appealing and more important. So all the people within that geographic area were part of a nation or race. And so there's a geographic as well as a linguistic unity. And also we should note that behind many of these uh, moves towards building a more fixed nation is a myth of a common heritage or origin. For example, going back to ancient Rome, the myth that Aeneas, the last survivor of the Trojan War, founded Rome and, and thus the Roman Empire. The belief, the English myth that Brutus, a descendant of Aeneas, then came and found the island of Britain and founded the British race. So this is connected to the notion of lineage, 
but expanded into a political, geopolitical um, concept. The issue of religion, however, complicated national identity because religion could unify a people. Religion could be one of those things that helps to reinforce national identity. So, for example, in England, Anglican Protestantism was the state religion, was officially the religion that all people were supposed to adhere to. Similarly, in the Ottoman Empire, Islam was the state religion, the official religion of the ruling class, the rulers, and imposed downward. However, religion could create difference within a nation, so it could go against that national race. Because in England, in the Ottoman Empire, in most countries, there was at least some form of toleration of certain minority religious groups. Uh, not always, and this was something that changed over time, and one day, a uh, religious minority could be tolerated, the next day they might be burnt at the stake, but we can see that religion, which was another form of race, could create tensions with the nation-state and the national identity. So when the word race is used to describe a religious union or commonality, something that binds a group together by, via their religious identity, it can be a little confusing because does it refer to their religious union, to their national union, to some other unifying trait. The Ottoman Empire was referred to, the people of the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, were referred to as both a nation and a race in common language of the time, so it's used synonymously. People of Jewish faith uh, were called a nation or a tribe, and more rarely called a race. They weren't often called a race, but they were called a nation, which is ironic because the Jews at this period had no homeland. There was no Jewish nation state. There was no country. So they were all dispersed throughout Europe, yet they were still considered a nation. And to further complicate the issue of religion and race and how religion is seen both as a unifying factor that uh, uh, supplements or signals what we now call racial difference and also as a trait that might cut across racial differences or modern understandings of racial difference, we see that Christians recognized Muslims and Jews as fellow people of the book. All had the same core scriptures, and Muslims and Jews recognized each other as people of the book as well. So there is a commonality there. There's something bonding these three groups together, yet at the same time, they all also viewed themselves as distinct, as religiously distinct, because of the differences in their faiths. So religion, again, here is a very complicated issue when it comes to how it overlaps with modern categories of racial difference. Let's look at religion just a little bit more, and how, again, religious ideas in Shakespeare's time overlapped with and provided the basis for modern notions of racial difference. We should note that it was commonly believed in this period that one's religious identity, one's faith, was not just a spiritual matter that conferred morality upon one, but that it was a bodily, physical matter, that your religious identity conferred certain physiological traits upon you. So it was commonly believed, for example, that people of the Jewish faith, especially Jewish men, had all sorts of physiological traits usually considered as defects, that were not shared by Christians. So race and religion, again, the modern notion of race is connected to or has its roots in these older notions of religious difference. Yet the also commonly held belief that all humans descended from Adam, the same human uh, ancestor, suggested that there was some sort of commonality or unity behind all these differences. So the difference that divides Christians from Jews from Muslims, both spiritually and physically, was introduced through conversion. That as people converted, changed religions, defied God's will, etc., etc., that this introduced religious and physiological differences, or what we would call today racial difference. So this also goes to show us just how fraught and dangerous and anxiety-inducing the notion of conversion could be, because 
conversion was not just about changing faith, but it threatened the essence of the self on both the physical and spiritual level. It was a form of physical and spiritual adulteration. And so we can see why perhaps conversion was such an important issue, why wars of religion were so violent and bloody during this period, why conversion was enforced upon so many people because of the way it was viewed as essential to your identity on all levels. Given how flexible the word race is, as we've seen, that it can be used in Shakespeare's time to refer to one's family, one's faith, one's national origin, uh, it shouldn't surprise us that we see it also used to talk about gender and sex. And so men and women could be labeled or could be thought of as different races. The sexual difference could be called a racial difference in Renaissance terms. And here, usually, it is women that are called the other race. Because, of course, the dominant perspective, the normal, quote-unquote, normal point of view, is from the masculine viewpoint. And in particular, women like Amazons, who were the dangerous mythological race of warrior women, who had a society turned upside down, they were figured as an exotic or strange race that needed to be tamed, which we've seen already in plays like Midsummer Night's Dream. And at the same time, not only were these exotic women from strange lands considered a different race, but the lands themselves were often figured as Amazonian and feminized. So as the colonial project was getting underway during this period, we see that exotic lands, foreign lands, are regularly sexualized and feminized. And the process of colonial exploration and conquest is figured as, imagined as, discussed as, a form of sexual domination. When writers discussed foreign lands and foreign peoples, they often figured the difference or imagined the difference between us and them in contradictory fantasies of sexual deviance. So, for example, we see that foreigners, especially people in the Asian nations or African nations and the New World, were often considered and discussed as effeminate, and they were considered inferior, lacking a kind of masculine vigor that defined white European men. And so we see that they're, the foreign men are imagined as enslaved to and cuckolded by their lustful women. The women have these insatiable sexual desires that the men can't satisfy, and the women are completely out of control. They have no respect for the men. They, they have them wrapped around their little finger. But at the same time, these fantasies are contradicted by other fantasies, other tales and stories, where these foreigners are imagined as hypersexual and animalistic. And so they're seen as a sexual threat to European males. They threaten the chastity of European women because they, of course, are feared to have a, a, a desire, an almost insatiable hunger for European women. And their lustfulness even extends to same-sex practices. That was another way to mark out the difference of others, to fantasize or imagine them as being deviant in that sexual practice. And both men and women, foreign men and women, were imagined as physically grotesque. They were imagined and written about and even illustrated as having grotesquely enlarged genitalia, which was both the sign of their sexual deviance and the result of their sexual deviance. So all these fantasies about sex went into defining and, and differentiating between, again, quote unquote, us and them. And it shouldn't be too hard to imagine and to see how many of these sexual fantasies still exist today in, our, in the ways that we conceptualize racial difference. And what do these fantasies do? Well, on one hand, they allow the authors to reinforce normality, our normal behavior versus their deviance. 
but of course while also having a sort of vicarious but disavowed sexual pleasure to fantasize all these things that one cannot perform because they are considered wrong or deviant or forbidden imagining that the other person is doing it and thus getting to enjoy that titillation while also disowning it and dismissing them as inferior. Um, and as the colonial projects started to go, get underway, again, the 16th and 17th centuries during which Shakespeare lived is the beginning of the European expansion into the New World and Africa, etc., etc., and the beginnings of colonialism and imperialism, we see that gender and the modern category of race, as it starts to emerge, reinforce one another. That is, that women and the inferior, quote-unquote, inferior races are continually thought of in ana analogous terms. Women are compared more and more often to the, quote-unquote, inferior races, and the inferior races are compared to women. So both are pathologized. Both are made to be viewed as inferior from the perspective of the white European male. And so both gender, both women and uh, racial others need to be, via this logic, according to this logic, placed under male European control. So gender, sexuality, as a form of identity, reinforces the notion of race as a category of identity, and the emergence of race as a way of dividing people, of naming people, serves to reinforce gender difference and gender imbalance superiority, social superiority of men over women. So finally we come to class, economic and social distinctions. And this is probably the most common usage of the word race in Shakespeare's period. And it signals the very basic, very simple, but fundamental and essential difference in Shakespeare's society between the noble and the common. For a long period, through, throughout the Middle Ages, up through Shakespeare's period, social distinctions are imagined as rooted in nature, in blood. They're a biological difference. The peasants inherit, inherit their peasanthood. The nobles inherit, through their blood, their nobility. And we can see that this you know, pseudo-biological, they wouldn't have used that term, but this biological difference serves to justify the social hierarchy and servitude. If you are a noble because you're born to be a noble, well then of course you deserve to be a noble. And the peasants, they're just born that way, so they cannot rise out of their status. So as with all ideologies, as with all ways of conceptualizing difference, this notion of economic difference as a racial difference, or in terms of race, as a fixed biological difference, serve to reinforce the social hierarchy of the time. And interestingly enough, again, there's a certain analogy where both peasants and people of inferior foreign races are unified by their baseness. They have a certain commonality to them. Um, so race, uh, the modern category of race, overlaps with the categories of class in Shakespeare's time. And it's important to note that while class was viewed as a biological, natural, uh, physically inhering aspect of one's personality, again, you're born as a peasant, you're born as a noble, this was being challenged and had been challenged for decades, centuries even, by increasing rates of social and economic mobility. And it's one of the questions that Shakespeare asks over and over in his plays, is one's noble nature or a gentle nature, the term he often uses more often than noble, is gentility inherited or can one become gentle? Is it something that you're born with or something that you can develop? Because while the common belief was that it was inherited, social change, reality showed that, that one could move up or down the social ladder. So let's review part one. When we talk about race in Shakespeare, we face a challenge that our concept of identity and what defines someone's identity is very different from how people in Shakespeare's time defined their identity. They had different categories that they based identity on from how we base our identity. And we see that what we conceive of as racial difference in the modern world 
was imagined across a whole range of different categories. Modern racial difference was conceived as a religious difference, as national difference, as gender difference, etc., etc. So all the things that we associate with race were divided up or associated with all sorts of other different factors. And this has been called racism without race because, of course, they acknowledged difference and difference via skin color was acknowledged, but they didn't have the same name for it. They didn't have the same concept for it. But obviously, these differences did work to organize and differentiate between people. These differences were ways that certain groups were marginalized and oppressed while other groups were empowered. So there is a form of racism, even if they didn't necessarily understand the differences in the same way that we understand those differences. And finally, we can see that all of these different ways in which difference was conceived of in Shakespeare's time, through sexuality, through class, etc., etc., that these different categories help to develop our modern notion of race. That is, what we call race today was distilled from these various understandings of difference in Shakespeare's time, and we have come up with a different way of uniting and conceiving of how people are distinct from one another and how people can be grouped into individual categories. So while they didn't have race, they didn't they were proceeding towards something like what we call race today. And in the next part of this lecture, I'll talk more about specifically how skin color and blackness signified in Shakespeare's time and where these ideas came from.